How y'all doing? Wow, wow, wow. This is fun. Just good to be here. I'm in the right place. I can tell that. <laughs> Phew. And uh, yeah, worship is amazing, huh? We worship Him in spirit and truth, so the revelation of who He is is where our worship comes from, and, and that just seems to bring that same truth, which is Him, in the room, right? I just believe when it's from the heart, when we're not just doing worship time, but from our heart, really engage. You can have that in your life. I I want you to have that in your life. Please don't get overwhelmed by life and not have that in your life. Get overwhelmed by Him. So you see everything through that truth. You can be laying on your bed in the morning and just have this same time and experience. You don't make appointments with God. You don't make a date with God. You don't just go out and hang out for an hour a day. If you did that with your wife, you probably wouldn't have that close of a relationship. (laughs) So be with him. Be with him. Sometimes we get the idea we're just going to pray for an hour a day or that's our prayer time. It's no, it's fellowship and communion with God. Amen. Amen. Very excited. Got a lot of things stirring in me right now. This was fun. You have a lot of children here. (laughs) Like, like, yeah. This might be in the top three, like, adult slash children ratio I've ever been in. This is, you got the fruitful multiply down pat. No, like, turn the page. There's a, there's so much gospel after those first two chapters. So they're nailing that. If you go the rest of the way, they're going to nail it. They got the first two chapters. Turn the page. You guys got it. So I'm proud of you. <laughs> like you really got it. <laughs> Lord Jesus. I just was overwhelmed by it. I walked down the middle aisle and I said, I said to a couple, I said, there's a lot of children. <laughs> so I was just standing here talking and I got, I got, so when I look like I'm hesitating, it's not because I don't know what to say. I'm just listening. And, but I realized there's really a lot of children. So that's amazing. You know, when, when, when the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply to Adam and Eve, he, he wasn't just talking about children. He, the whole context of the chapter is his likeness and his image. Yeah. And he already gave a law, each seed after its own kind. And then he makes man in his image. He doesn't even make woman until he sees man functioning in what he's made to be. It's powerful. There's not even a woman on the scene until man's naming the animals and God's not upstaging him, correcting him, changing his mind. Whatever Adam said, it was so. He's moving in that authority. He's moving in that dominion. And God had made him to function with him. Fair to say, as him. God's still God. Yeah? Yeah? And he said, it's not good that he be alone. He has no one comparable. It wasn't until he was functioning. And there's an expression in the Word of God that he was actually acting on what he was created to be. That you even see the woman come on the scene. She's not another lump of clay. That's important. He didn't do two lumps of clay. A male and a female lump of clay. He actually reached into the fullness of God that was in the man and brought forth the woman, flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, so of the man. So he took what was one and made it two. So two could be one. And in that place, be fruitful and multiply. Does that just mean fill the room with children? Multiply his image. Till the whole earth is full of His glory. It's incredible. And I think along the way we've missed it because man had fallen and when man fell, he fell so far. Like man didn't just fall. He, he's nothing like God. So in today's Christianity circle and world, you've got to be very careful that you catch that, that you don't just stay there where a man's nothing like God and thank God he considers us. No, he's never lost sight of us. He's considered us from the beginning. His love's never failed. He's not the one that's wavered. Like while we were yet sinners, God sent his son. That's amazing. That means he's not seeing me 
for where I'm at. He's seeing me for where he's going to place me through Christ, where he created me to already be. Amen. Don't miss that. I know you're not missing that. This is, this is a solid. You can perceive things when you get around people. This is real solid atmosphere. And this is really good atmosphere, buddy. Yeah, they ain't just making children here. <laughs> But they are doing that very well. I'm still a little taken back, so forgive me. It's not often I get this taken back, but I'm really a little taken back right now. I said to the one guy, I just says, everybody have this many children? So, so, oh my goodness. Well, that's amazing. But the whole idea of the Lord in the beginning was that Adam and Eve looked like him, manifested him, thought like him, loved like him, functioned like him. They were one. In fact, the tree that he was told not to eat was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That means man wasn't even made to toss those two around and compare those two. He wasn't even made. He was just made for the image. He wasn't even made to handle the knowledge of good and evil. He wasn't even ever to eat that tree. He was just supposed to stay innocent and pure before the Lord. And all he was to know was the Lord. Like that's a beautiful created value and purpose. And that got lost through sin. And it, it didn't just get lost. It got so lost that man didn't look anything like God started it off to be and intended it to be. The psalmist is actually sounds puzzled. He says, what is man? Psalms 8, you can find it in Hebrews 2. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, that he would consider him, that he would visit him, that, that he would give him dominion over the works of his hands, that he'd make him his crowning creation and, and glory. Like that's an incredible... He's saying, what is up with this man? That God would consider him in the way he's considered him. You have to go back to the beginning. If you look at man apart from God, there's no reason. I'm not correcting the worship tonight. The songs, the, 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 the one song I'd heard the little phrase about not knowing how, why, why he loves me this way. I heard that little phrase. I hear it a lot in church. Not correcting that at all. But there is an answer to that. I can actually know. God loves me for who he created me to be. The, there's a truth in all of us. That's found in Christ. So, so he never, because God is love, because love isn't self-seeking, he's not hurt, angry, or mad. That's why for God so loved the world. In other words, he can't change. Who knows he can't change? So the way he sees me, he can't change. When sin abounds, he doesn't get frustrated and give up on me like people do. When sin abounds, grace comes even greater. Now that doesn't give permission for sin where we're concerned. It just shows who God is. In other words, you don't have the power to change his mind. His love never fails. His mercy triumphs over judgment. Yeah? Uh, so he made me to be that way. Come on, catch this. He made me to be that way from the beginning. And to know nothing but him. And manifest nothing but Him. In that place, He brings forth the woman and the two come together and each seed after their own kind. So everything that comes through them comes from the same place. Individuals, different personalities, we all look different, but we all look like Him. That's actually the goal of the Gospel. It's rarely preached clearly like that. Most people get tricked into surviving, getting God to do things for them, safe, protection, provision. It's all about God doing something for me. That's why people are so moved by life and circumstances. When you ask people that go to church how they're doing, they usually tell you their trials. That's a giveaway. That means we're in Christianity for what He can do for me. We're coming to God for safety, protection. Instead of transformation, for truth, for a different eye, perspective, motive, reason for being, wake up different. Like be alive for a different reason than before I knew Him. Yeah. 
Like before it was weird because it was all about me. I'm just in survival mode before I knew him, but I didn't even like me. <laughs> but survival mode wanted to take care of me, but I didn't even like me. I needed you to like me to prove I was likable. And I hoped you liked me. And if you didn't like me, well, I wasn't surprised because I didn't like me. <laughs> I'm just being real. And I did things and I had secrets. And it was a lot like the man Paul described in Romans 7. That was bound and lost without Christ. That wasn't Paul's life, by the way. I think you all know that, right? You all know that. You're making that clear, right? Good. That thing that you always want to do and you don't do, that, that was before Christ. That, that'll tear down your value. That'll make you live with secrets. That'll make you look in the mirror and see what you don't like. But isn't it amazing that God never looked at me and saw that? God looked at me and saw what He created me to be, what He knew I could be if He's in me, if I'm surrendered and He's in me. He knows what I'll look like. And He paid an amazing price called the life of His Son, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's an incredible price to me. Like, how do you value that? How do you put a price tag on the blood of Jesus? Sounds like high dollar. Nobody spends a lot for nothing. Nobody preached this stuff to me growing up. I went to VBS. I went to a bunch of different churches as a child. My mom mixed it up, tried to keep me entertained. And I didn't want to go. She'd get me out of bed to go, and I'd act like I was sleeping. I'm just telling you, because I didn't get it. Nobody was telling me this stuff. It just took me to I was 33 and got saved and started reading the Bible and going, Oh started realizing just how he saw me and what he created me for. And I didn't want to be the same. I didn't want to be the same at all. And I didn't let anybody talk me into it. Well, yeah, you know, but we're always, yeah, but we're always going to, yeah, but... Couldn't find that in my Bible. I couldn't find it in my Bible that I was always going to have my moments. <laughs> or fallouts. I'm going to have my ups and downs. Couldn't find that in my Bible. And I started to realize that we taught ourselves that. And then we think it's humility to hold on to what we taught ourselves because that's what kind of separates us. But he doesn't want us separated. He wants us one. So I grew up hearing this phrase. Maybe you did growing up. You don't hear it in this circle. This is amazing. But you grew up probably hearing as well. Yeah, but that was Jesus. You know what I'm saying? In other words, unattainable. That's something we could never... So let's just be amazed that He considers us. And let's just sing our best, try our best. But that's Jesus. And then there's this mystery. Like, why would He care so much? Why does He even love me? Well, He wants to put His life in me. He wants to put His life in you. His nature and His ways. He wants to do what He did with Adam. He's doing it through Christ. So Christ became what we were so we can get back to what it is we were intended to be. We've turned it into a prayer that takes me to heaven or something that makes sure my vats and barns are full or praying for safety or protect the things that are dear to me. That's not wrong, but that's not why He came. That's just stuff He does. Why He came was to get me out of darkness into the light. To get me from the power of Satan back to the power of God. Yeah? yeah? To get me out of that sin nature, that thing that was just all about me, deny myself, pick up my cross and follow Him. So now I realize He wants to reproduce and manifest Himself on the earth through as many as would believe. Not as many as would go to church, as many as would believe. There's a lot of people that go to church that don't even believe they can look like Him. Can I quote some scriptures for you? Challenge you a little? He says in Ephesians 5 that we ought to walk in love just as Jesus loved. Not somewhat like or kind of close. Most Christians don't believe that's possible because He's Jesus and we're us. And we forget the person of Holy Spirit. We forget surrender. We forget actually we don't even sometimes understand why we came into this thing. We, if we just came into this thing to get saved, meaning go to heaven... We'll never understand the rest of this, this stuff. Like walk in love just as He loved? That means on my darkest day, He doesn't lose sight of me. That means on somebody's darkest day, we don't lose sight of them. 
That means we don't get frustrated, antagonized with them, give up, grow weary and well-doing, write them off, sign them off. Well, if they didn't change by now, they ain't never going to change. We ought to be glad God doesn't have that mentality. See, there's a thing we learned when we were fallen. It's called the way of the world and the way that seems right. But I found in my Bible that way never brings life. It does the opposite. It always brings death. But it's prevalent. The way that seemeth right actually gets preached from the pulpit a lot. And empowers men to stay where they were, but now they have a confession. But they're still the same in many ways. Still hurt, still insecure, still offended, still unresolved conflicts with my spouse. Stuff that we just think is normal, but it all hinges on the self-centered thing. We're supposed to walk in love just as... So he comes to the earth and he comes to his own and his own knew him not. They didn't receive him. And yet nothing was made and they were made through him. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him. And yet when he came to his own, his own knew him not. And they didn't receive him. When he spoke, they were like, what's he saying? Do you understand he got killed for his words? This is just symbolic of how lost humanity is apart from him. Truth stands in front of them for three years and speaks. It can't get any clearer. But it's the opposite of how they're thinking because they're, they don't even know him. They're so lost in the fall that they can't hear truth. They're living by another wisdom. So the truth was so contrary to the wisdom they were living by that his words were worthy of death. That's sobering, people. We got to make sure we see that so we don't live some of that. Like, you guys are strong here, man. I can feel it. I'm just going to, I'm going to come out real strong and straight with y'all. You can handle it. No, you can. Like, I don't want any right to have a right in my life. I don't, I don't want anything in my life that gives me a right to be something I can't find in him. Because Christ in me is the hope of the glory of God. So I'm going to live my life by the Spirit of God, right? I'm going to live my life in the truth of God. So I have to deny my self. Self is the, is the dilemma. So, there's no love in selfishness. There's no selfishness in love. God didn't make man for himself. He made man for his image. So what happened when the image got lost, man took on the nature and image of the enemy of God, the deceiver, the one that lied to Eve and the one that Adam followed Eve. So he really followed the devil. He committed treason. And he took on that nature. Are you all with me? So he didn't just sin. He got totally transformed. And, and lost the nature and image of God, and what was love became self-centered. Totally the opposite of love. Flip coin, opposite. Like there's not one thing about one that's like the other. Are you with me? This is intense. It's this serious. It's just not preached this way. We usually get a gospel message that warms my heart, gives me hope, and benefits me in some way. Instead, it challenges me and changes me for the rest of my life so that the rest of my life I can live his life. See, because the other one is so weak and wishy-washy. Like, I'm just subject and at the mercy of everybody else. When I'm self-centered, I'm in the biggest prison of my life. I'm always dictated by life instead of the giver of it. So how you feel about me dictates me. You're angry at me, you do me wrong, now I live done wrong. I'm just constantly controlled by my environment when I'm self-centered. And when you're self-centered, you think you're in control. But you're constantly controlled by your environment, by people. So you cut somebody off and you think you're winning. And the whole time you're cutting them off, you're a living product and expression of whatever you're cutting them off for. They're still dominating your life. It's a prison. Self-centeredness is a prison. 
Man was never made for himself. He was made for God's image. The biggest problem on the planet is, is man waking up and living for himself. It's where every argument, contention, and animosity has survived and lived from. And we call it normal. And then we psychologically try to work through it and assess it instead of spiritually attack it, call it what it is, and die to it in a place of prayer. I was never made for me. Jesus did not die on the cross to keep me alive. He died on the cross to resurrect who he is in me, to get life back on the inside of me, to raise me literally from the dead, because I was dead. And now I'm alive. I was blind. And now I see. And I can't bring any mentality and motive from my former life into the new life, because old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So I have to put off the old, not balance it, find self-control. I put it off and I put on the new. This is a place of prayer. This is a place of you getting alone with God and seeing it. How do you walk in love just as Jesus loved? Because you can't do that and neither can I apart from Him. You can't just wake up today and say, okay, we're going to get her done. No, because there's mentalities and motives we've been trained by. Things get crossed up all the time. You can't even get a grip on your feelings sometimes. Somebody does something wrong, you can't even get out of your head because you didn't expect them to do that and it actually surprised you. And you're wondering how they were even capable of doing that and you can't get that out of your head and then there's feelings attached. See, it's only a place of prayer where you settle in your heart. Nobody owes you a thing. You're on the earth for one reason, to manifest Christ. That's why I'm on the earth, first and foremost. That place, I'll be the best husband. I'll be the amazing dad. I'll be an incredible grandpa and a super good friend. If I'm living to manifest Christ, and I have no other string in my life but to manifest Christ. Phew! You say, well, you can't even live that way. Yes, Jesus lived that way. He let men hit him, and he was a thousand percent right. In everything he said and did, and men hit him as if he was a thousand percent wrong. Like they weren't just saying he was wrong. They were saying he's demonic, heretic, and worthy of death. They were saying he's way wrong, like as there's a difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he's a thousand percent right, and he let men hit him to pay the price full for me to live what I'm talking about. And now I ain't going to live that? No, I'm going to live that. Because he sent Holy Spirit to empower that. So if I want to love like he loved, then I see his first love and I've received that love. People that don't receive that love and just were hoping to be loved that way but never really received that love, won't love that way. Watch. People that don't understand they're totally, completely clean and forgiven in his sight have a hard time with unforgiveness. I asked the Lord why people in his house have such a hard time with unforgiveness. He said they've never seen how clean they are in my sight. They don't believe they're completely forgiven. Because if you ever accept that you're absolutely clean in the sight of God as if you've never sinned, you will not hold men's trespasses against them. You won't even have a grid for unforgiveness. When Christians say, I'm trying to forgive, that means you're in unforgiveness. And the only reason we have a grid for it because we've lived separate from him. But now we're joined. So if you don't owe me anything, how are you breaking anything, failing anything? How are you violating anything? So if I see you living out of conduct, that should hurt my heart for you, not hurt my heart because of you. And I should weep for you, not weep because of you. Because I should realize, forgive them, Father, they... See, this is why relationship with God is so, so, so important. We'll talk about it this weekend. But I'm just laying a a little foundation to start this thing off. And I'm just telling you, let me quote some scripture. So any man that, 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 that says he abides in me ought to walk even as 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 he walked or abides in him. That's first John two uh, verse verse six, first John two, six. If any man says he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. This is a disciple you talked about that had intimacy with him. The chapter before he wrote, we'll walk in the light as he's in the light. Chapter two, he said, if we say we abide, dwell, remain in him, 
will walk even as He walked. Which means John saying it's totally possible. Can I be honest? Most Christians say it's not. Most leaders say it's not. But Scripture says to live that way. I'm sticking with Scripture. Because then I'll find the grace that empowers me to do what he's writing about because we're not self-made. There's no boasting in men. You're not just going to wake up and walk like Jesus walked. You're going to look at him, honor him, receive his, his, his uh, messages he sent through his life, how he didn't let men change him, how he didn't get hurt and hard in his heart, how he didn't cut people off, how he opened the door to everyone that believes. He didn't put exceptions except that Pharisee. What an idiot. Come on. No compromise. Just amazing. Now He invites me in to where He lives. He doesn't just invite me to come and pray a prayer so I can go to heaven and hope He blesses me and gets me through life. Oh my goodness, I meet... Because I go all over. I'm in churches every weekend. Countless, countless, countless people that are coming to God trying to get through life. They're Christians for their own sake. And they're not having fun. Because they're super self-conscious and circumstance driven. So they always feel empty and a step behind and wondering what they did to not have everything that they think God should be doing and giving. And so they come to God for themselves instead of come to Him for His great name. There's only one motive to Christianity. It's so that His life comes in you and shines through you like you come to God and give your life to Him for His sake. Paul said to lay a hold of that which He laid a hold of me for. That means God has a motive in obtaining you. So you can't come to Him for blessing. Will you get blessed coming to Him? Yeah, our God, our own God, Psalm 67 will bless us. I, I'm so blessed I don't know what to do. I've never prayed for a blessing that I'm aware of in my whole life. You just wake up knowing Him. You're blessed knowing Him. You're blessed knowing you're forgiven and clean and free. You put on righteousness. It's undescribable blessing. Yeah, you walk through life and you have a motive that's in God and you see people through His eyes. What a blessing. You, you, you're just walking in truth. There's, you can't even describe the blessings of just life in the Spirit, but we're just, we sell cheap and just look for provision, seasons of peace and protection. And that's kind of our goals. And those things just happen in Him. Our goal should be the transformation of our lives so I'm looking through His eyes. So I see what He sees when I see you. Yeah? It's huge. Ephesians 5 says, Walk in love just as He loved. doesn't say somewhat like or get as close as possible. It says just like He loved. You can check it. It's there. Jesus said, Any man that believes in Me, the things I do, He'll do. And even greater things because I'm going to my Father. That's pretty amazing. First John says, walk in the light one as he's in the light. Not somewhat like. First John 2 says, if you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. You know what's in First John 3? It says, if you have this hope of seeing him face to face someday and becoming just like him. In other words, there's, there's this grace that I see on our lives to be everything that we see him to be. And yet there seems to be this mystery that someday we're going to see him face to face and this full revelation. And it's like he says that what we're going to be then, we, I'm not, I don't even really know, but I just know when we see him as he is, we're going to be like him. So John has this revelation. But look, don't limit because before he says that, he already said abide in him. If you say you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. So he's not preaching li limitation. He's saying, I can have everything I see him to be. Everything I watched him be in front of men, everything I heard, everything, I can embrace it and it can all be my revelation through willingness, through prayer, through grace, through the anointing of God, through Holy Spirit, right? But then he says in John 3, he says, you know, when he comes, we're going to see him face to face and I'm not even sure what we're going to be when that happens. Because you know how he also, Paul writes, in the twinkling of an eye? So he, they preach and they're preaching this thing that some full manifestation of something's going to take place 
when we behold him in that day face to face. Who knows that's scriptural? But yet John's saying we're already one and walk like he walked, right? So watch what he says. He says, we're not sure what we're going to be, but, but we know we're going to uh, be like him. When we see him as he is, we'll be like him. And anyone that has this hope in him. Okay, so now that's a faith for living Christianity. In other words, I wonder how many people ever even wake up and have that hope in them for years. I'm not being rude. Years could go by and you might not even wake up and think about that hope. You're just doing life, praying to God, and got your list. I'm just being real, I'm not being mean. But anyone that has that hope in them, that one day I'm going to stand before him and see him as he is, and faith actually believes that, and, and you, you know that every step you're taking is taking you to that day where you're going to stand before him. He says, anyone that has this hope in him, watch, purifies himself even as he is pure. That one almost makes me lose it. Because I know from 29 years of pastoring and being a leader and being a preacher, Christians don't even believe that's possible because they have weighed themselves by themselves and they haven't seen themselves in him. Listen to what it says. You might want to look there and make sure I'm telling you the truth. It's first, third verse of 1 John 3. Anyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I don't even know if I've met pastors that believe that's possible, let alone their people. Just be honest with me. We've been almost trained to think that's an overthought. That that's the Lord and this is us. But he has seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And he has made us one with them. He says in Philippians 2, have this same mind in you that was also in him. In other words, if you read that chapter and see what was making Jesus tick, you can have that same motive. You can have that same servant heart. You can have that same surrender. So if Jesus said, follow me, that's pretty real. <laughs> follow me? Is this some kind of joke, Lord? <laughs> How am I supposed to follow you? <laughs> put off the old and put on the new. Cast down everything that doesn't look like me and put on everything that does because I'm here to empower it if you're willing. Now you're in, you're ready to run this race worthy of a prize. And guard your heart, because out of it flows the issues of life, and never grow weary and well-doing. Put your hand to the plow and never look back. You get the idea, you're coming. <laughs> oh, 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 man, that's just good right there. <laughs> See, growing up, nobody talked to me like this. This would have been heresy in all the churches my mom took me to. They'd have threw you out on your head and said, man, you are messed up. You need to go learn. But Scripture says that if in my heart I have the hope of seeing Him one day as He is and be made like Him, that I'll purify myself even as He is pure. Now you tell me, I'm not talking to you in the room and judging you, you tell me how many people you've met along the way that even believe that's possible, let alone are pursuing it and even thinking about that hope. I mean... You guys are lit up. I can feel it in my heart. But this would be a conviction. How many of us are living with that conscious hope that we're living to go see Him, to be with Him, to stand before Him? Amen. Or are we just trying to get through life and He's part of that? We get tricked into doing life instead of doing Him. So then life tends to speak louder than truth and that's a problem because it's truth that makes you free. That's why a lot of sincere people aren't living free because they're not living their life in truth. They're living their life in reality and trying to apply truth to their realities. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why when you ask people how they're doing, they tell you their trials. It's a dead giveaway. They don't tell you their relationship. 
They don't tell you how they've heard God give you direction and speak. They just tell you their trials and usually say, keep me in prayer. Am I being honest? See, how's it going, man? Well, it's been, I mean, I'm all right. I'm all right. It's just been a challenging six months, man. It's been tough. You know, I had this happen. Then I had this. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah, no, but I'm good. But if you think about me, man, you could pray for me. That's just a normal Christian conversation, not demeaning it, being cynical. It's just a giveaway that we base how we're doing on how it's going, which means our pursuit is better circumstances. Instead of knowing him more. So wonder if all hell's breaking loose. Wonder if things are going crazy. Are we established? Are we rock solid enough? Or do we fall apart and grow weary and well doing? Do we internalize the trials? Do we bear the identity of affliction? Or do we manifest Christ in the middle of it all? You see what I'm saying? You see the difference? Because my Bible says to glory. In tribulation, but I'm not sure what that looks like to be. I've never seen anybody glory in tribulation. <laughs> That's when they call for counseling appointments. <laughs> and they're crying. No, I'm being real. Listen, listen. It's Romans 5. You, you've been justified by faith, right? So you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ being justified by faith. That's verse 1. Verse 2. And by faith you have access into His grace in which you now stand in hope of the glory of God. That's the second verse. Sounds like we're rampant. you got peace with God. You've been justified by faith and you have peace with God through Jesus. Now by that same faith you have access into His working power in hope of the manifestations of God. And not only that, you glory in your tribulation. Oh! Why? Because you know tribulation brings perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope will never let you down because His love's in your heart through the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden you realize why you're on the earth and it doesn't have to do with if things are good or bad. It has nothing to do with peace or affliction. It's all an opportunity to manifest Christ. When you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze a Christian, you ought to get Christ. Isn't it amazing you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Jesus? Now, if you squeezed an orange and got apple juice, you'd be wigged out. If you squeezed an orange and it was lemon juice, you'd be like, what? Some kind of genetic hybrid misfit. Well, that would be weird. If you squeeze a big old orange and apple juice was in your cup, you'd spit it back in the cup because you knew you squeezed an orange. It'd be weird. Right. It should be weird when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ. So I wonder if the enemies just learned, ah, oh, they're in it for a whole lot of reasons. They ain't really surrendered. They ain't doing what Jesus did. They're singing to him. They're praying to him. But they ain't doing what he did. They ain't following him. They ain't surrendered. They're very much alive. In fact, most people don't really love God. This is the devil. This is how he thinks. I could show you in Scripture. They don't really love God. They just need God. So I'll just put a little pressure here and there. I'll roam around like a roaring lion, seek God devour, because they don't really live by faith. They live by circumstances, and they're all praying for calm seas. Huh. Yeah, we'll rough them up a little. Did you ever notice the same storm comes to the wise man that comes to the foolish? That the wise man didn't open a door, it just came because he heard the word. That's the war we're in. Satan comes for the word's sake in Mark 4, the sower sows the word. And Satan comes immediately for the word's sake. He doesn't come for your sake. He comes to make sure the word never becomes established in you. So that the word never becomes flesh. And then we take affliction personal and make it all about us. Satan's after me. No, he isn't. He's there to destroy the word. And as soon as you think he's after you, he's already got the word. Come on. Well, he's just been lying to me and I'm just tired of hearing his voice. Why doesn't God stop it? He keeps saying I'm nothing. Well, then you must be something if he's a liar. So why do you have to stop hearing his voice? Stop believing. Watch. My sheep hear and obey. My sheep hear and obey. Uh, strangers they won't. 
He didn't say you won't hear it. He said you won't follow, which means you have to hear to be able to follow. And we're waiting for the voice to go away. Ah, God's waiting for you to stop believing it and seeing it's strange. See, when you know who you are and your identity is secure, the stranger's voice sounds really strange. If you're in question, if you don't have a good, healthy identity, if you're questioning yourself, you feel condemned, if you feel like you're not measured up, if you don't feel worthy, if you got all that insecurity stuff going on in you and you want to believe the gospel, but it's just hard to see that God could care that much and you have those kind of limitations in your belief system, stranger's voice sounds rational. But when you know your gods and you're surrendered, and He loves you, and He sees you holy, blameless, and above reproach, and has washed you clean of all your sins, and He has made you accepted in the Beloved, and you're righteous in His sight, stranger's voice sounds really strange. Yeah? yeah? So back to John 3. He purifies Himself even as He is pure. Think about that. This has been burning in my heart for months. I talk about it all the time. Because I realize that we at large, when I say we, the body of Christ, I'm going to talk about you in the room. We at large don't even believe this stuff. We don't even believe it's possible to be pure like he's pure. We actually think that's thin ice to even be standing on. Like, who do we think we are? No, it's who he says we are. 1 John 4 is really amazing. You know what verse 7 says? Verse 7 says... That anybody who loves, that, that we, we're, gonna, we're supposed to walk in love and love because God loves and God is love. And anyone who loves, so we're going to love because God is love. And anyone who loves is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, he who loveth not just doesn't know God. He didn't say you don't lead worship. He didn't say you don't pastor. He didn't say you don't go on a mission trip. He didn't say you don't do a daily devotion or aren't part of a home group. But guess what he did say? If you don't love, it's evidence you don't know him. It doesn't say you don't see your need for a Savior. It doesn't say you don't believe in the cross. It doesn't say you didn't repent and you don't feel sorry for your sins. It doesn't say any of that. It just says a very simple sentence. If you don't love, there's one reason, not one of two. You just don't know him like you could. That means it's impossible for me to have the relationship with him that Jesus paid for and not be changed by him into who he is. Do you get it? So now faith is burning in my heart because what scripture is telling me is there's no way that I can know him and not be changed by him. So eternal life, John 17, 3, eternal life. He said he gave eternal life to give eternal life to all that he's given me. And this is eternal life that they might know him. We've made eternal life a destination. Like if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. Church after church after church, the focus is all going to heaven instead of heaven coming back into me and me being reunited with God and becoming one. Oh my goodness, he's the way back to the Father. Our tracks say he's the way to heaven. He never even said he's the way to heaven. We've said it. He said he's the way back to the Father. What happened to Adam? He got separated from love. Became in need of love. We all got born into that deficit. We've all needed love from the time we can remember. From the littlest one in here to the oldest, we know what I'm talking about. We've all needed love, value. We've needed to fit in. We've had identity crisis. We've been finding ourselves along the way. And a short way in, young life, short way in, not long into life, you become a product of how you responded to how it unfolded. It becomes your story, your life. And in that, you find your value and Sometimes develop personality, et cetera, et cetera. And then we study all that and give us types and letters. And... But it's all a product of surviving. Not even knowing who we are. Not one of us in this room knew who we were when we were little growing up. If you have amazing parents and they teach you and empower you, yeah. But still, you still need friends and one of your friends laughs at you unjustly. That sometimes you can have all these other things, but that thing hurts so bad. Right? 
And all of a sudden you get jaded by something and all of a sudden your heart is in turmoil. And you might have some real important components, but because we're needy and we don't understand who we really are and why we're here, we become vulnerable on many other angles. And then we say, well, yeah, I had great parents, but... You ever hear those testimonies? No, it's because we didn't have the truth. That's why I preach this thing constantly everywhere I go. Like, preach it like this with passion so young people can even hear it and children can hear it and not get tricked by lies. Like, the reason God made man is to be found in God's image, period. There's no other reason in the Bible that man's on the earth. And every man's the will of God. Every man's the purpose of God. Life comes from God. There's a time to be born. So if we're sitting here, we're the will of God. So there can't be an accident in the room. Scripture says no way. No way is there an accident in the room. But how many people learn to believe and think they're an accident? That they don't fit in? That their life ain't worth it? Must have been born at the wrong time. Now sometimes I feel that way because of technology. I'm thinking, God... I know you do everything right, but you sure you didn't miss the clock on me? Shouldn't I have been 90, 100 years ago? It was just easier. I'm just zero technical. I struggle. Oh, I struggle so bad. I have a smartphone. I'm not smart with it. But I get by, but barely. But everything's just go online. Just Google it. Just do this. And I'm like, oh, God, I should have been 100 years ago. But I'm probably right on time, huh? Because I was predestined before the foundation of the world. So God knew me before anybody knew me. So I was in his plan from the beginning. And so were you. To be adopted in as sons and daughters. Ain't that something? So think about this. So we got 1 John 3 down. 1 John 4. He who loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. So I guess the way you love is the barometer of your relationship with God, or at least your understanding of that relationship. Are you with me on this? Be convicted by this. Don't get, you, don't get condemned. Don't nobody go the wrong way on this with me. <laughs> the measuring stick of knowing God is your love. And love doesn't think evil. It's patient. It's kind. Doesn't seek its own, keeps no record of the wrong done to it. Well, that would just end all counseling. Because <laughs> all counseling is practically 90-some percent counseling is people struggling with people. But we say, I love you. And then we live something else. It happens all the time. Like you could, I'm at this point, I, I pre, man, I've been before God on this thing. Like you're not bringing me into animosity in my home. My wife doesn't have the ability to break me down. I'm going to love her till the day I go be with Jesus. Now my wife ain't trying to antagonize me. She ain't doing anything. But she went through an eight year period where she was in identity crisis. Where she accused me of things that it wasn't even in my heart because she was hurting. She saw me through hurting eyes because she was insecure. She Pushed that my direction. Sometimes my kids intervene. Said, Mom, that is not Dad. What are you saying? My little kids intervene. Because she was just... See, you love your neighbor as yourself. When you don't see yourself good, then you see them like you see you. So my wife was in that for eight years, just comparing herself to me. People just say hi to me because they love you, Dan. They don't really care about me. I'm, I'm just the rhetorical. Like they got, They're just being rhetorical. They're just acknowledging me because I'm with you. That's a good way to throw away your value. The only reason people say hi to me is because I'm with you. I'm your wife. I'm like, well, okay. But if you weren't my wife, you still have the same value, purpose, and destiny, and potential. Well, no, that's just, you're supposed to tell me that, Dan. You see what that did to her? So for eight years, she shut down, disconnected with me. Think about that. Eight years sounds like a long time to people because they're living for themselves. If you're living for the kingdom, then you get into this one day as a thousand years, thousand years is a day thing. But if you're just living for her to change, eight years is a long time. And if you need something from her, eight years is a million years. And all of a sudden, we give time the power to change truth. But yet, truth's what makes me free. 
So then a counselor says, well, you got to understand some people just don't change. You only got one life to live. You've already spent eight years. I mean, what hope do you have that she'll change anytime soon? Next thing you know, you could be 16 years in, and now you just spent your whole life being mistreated by someone that has an identity crisis. Sometime you have to consider it's just time to move on. Well, you better be glad God didn't have that counselor and believe them. Hello? See, we got a wisdom from this world. But then we get a wisdom that's from God. Corinthians says that Christ Jesus is the wisdom of God for us. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom anyway. You see what I'm saying? So when I'm eight years into this thing, do I have any permission to give up on who she can be? Do I have any permission to take it personal if love takes no record of the wrong? Then why is it about the eight years? Why isn't it just about a wife that's in trouble? Why isn't it about just laying down your life and following Jesus? Because he never gave up. So if I'm supposed to carry my cross, I guess that's what I'm doing for those eight years. And every year since then. See? So that's why I'm so passionate, because I was in some of this stuff. At the same time, both my children sprung off the weakness of mom and ran and fulfilled things in their flesh. Both of my children. It looked like I was the only one in the home that kind of cared, right? And I couldn't hug my children for a season. I had no access to my wife. It looked like everything was blown up. But I'm no less a man of God, no less anointed. So I hugged everybody else's children. <laughs> no, I did. You know, the Lord told me you can't even preach this in a church in America and, 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 and have it accepted. The Lord said, hug everybody else's children and don't think for a second they have less value than your own. They all are the same to me. We covet what's ours. Now, I understand there's birthright and inheritance and name and passing on things. I get that. But what he was saying is, don't you feel sorry for yourself. Don't you get hurt. And don't you be a product of your present situation. Why don't you look beyond that and hug everybody else's children because they're all the same to me. That's, I would say that's pretty good wisdom. I was sitting on my bed one day and I was thinking about me as a dad. I was thinking about my wife because you know how you hear people say, well, if you're filled with Jesus and walking in love, everybody's just going to yay. No, a lot of times it's a total opposite. You can have five in a home and Jesus say it'll be three against two. Because if people have flesh in their heart and if they have other desires, they're actually threatened by your surrender. And you can love somebody perfectly and they can resist it and call it something else and get so deceived and blind in their own self. We just think if we're living by the Spirit, it's some spooky thing and everybody's just melting in front of you. <laughs> nope, I sat on my bed one day and at night I was weighing myself as a father and I was thinking about my children and, and the way I've been to them since I was saved. And I'm thinking, man, and the Lord said, out of the blue, he said, hey, do you think I'm the best father ever? That's what I heard in my heart. Well, that's a no brainer. You have to answer yes, right? I mean, it's the Lord asking you. You have to answer yes. There's no other answer. I said, yes, I do believe that. He said, and this sounded, sounded corny to me. He was just ministering to me. He said, do you believe I need a parenting program? He was intercepting my own thoughts. I said, no, Lord, that's silly. Why would you need a parenting program? You're the best father ever. He said, well, then why isn't everybody running to sit on my lap? Ain't that something? So here you got the best father ever, unconditional, unfailing love, righteousness, and the blood of Jesus speaking better things and not everybody's just running to sit on his lap. Why? Because it's a reflection of how people see themselves, sense of not belonging, and even a wrong view of the father. There's a whole mixed bag of things going on in family. What the family member has to do is make sure he's secure in who he is in Christ, that his conscience is clear, and he doesn't let the reactions of the family dictate motives in his heart. And he has to make sure he doesn't wake up to need them, but wake up to love them. Because if I find my identity through my family, I will never manifest Christ in the trial and trouble times. Are you hearing me? So when my kids run wild, I would just be hurt and offended, taken back, insecure. When my wife's doing this for eight years, all of a sudden, I, and if I'm needy, I'll never manifest Christ. 
But if I'm not, now you're squeezing a Christian. Guess who's coming out the whole time? So I flourished in those eight years. Like seriously, that's why I'm passionate and serious about what I'm preaching. Because you can't talk me out of it. I walked through eight years of it. And nothing changed. And then I pastor and people are wiping out over eight weeks. Be real. And eight months? Are you kidding? Something's got to give. Hang on eight months. Oh, I've been around. I've heard a lot of things in counseling appointments. Prove that we have a lot of expectations, a lot of rights, a lot of desires, a lot of chips on our shoulder and lines that can be crossed. You have to personally make sure none of that's in your life. It takes one person to pursue Christ and live Christ in a home. And if you get your eyes on any other factor, you will be decided by those things. Are you with me? Anyone who has this hope of seeing him as he is, I'm going to purify himself. Now I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to walk in love because God is love and reveal that I know him. I'm born of him and I know him. If I don't love, I reveal I don't know him. They don't say born of him in there. He's just making a point that if, see, a lot of people think, well, he's just talking about somebody that's not born again. No, he's not. He's talking about somebody that's not loving. Do you know how many people I know that see their need for a Savior, have confessed their sins and prayed the sinner's prayer sincerely and haven't pursued becoming love? Do you know how many people I know that pray prayer lists all the time and needs and intercede for things and actually pray and haven't pursued becoming love? And they get hurt and offended and they talk to you about their issues? Come on. The goal of our instruction is love. If we miss love, we've missed the point. Because the image is love. Y'all get that, right? If He made us in His image, He made us after Him to love. So in 1 John 4, He goes on saying that God is love, and this is how we know love, because God sent His Son. So we know love because God sent His Son. Why don't you look there? I've got to show you something. 1 John 4. If you have a Bible, look at 1 John 4. I want you to see this. God, you're good. You guys okay? Amen. I just, I'm just talking plain to you because I know this house is, you're groomed in a way. We, you need to be talked to like this because you've, you've heard this stuff. But it's just out of the mouths of two or more, every word's confirmed and established. Like this is the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel is my transformation. It's where God's nature becomes who I am in expressing. Watch what, watch what Philippians 2 says. Philippians 2 says that I do all things without grumbling and complaining. How many things? Okay, so there's never an exception. Ain't that something? Watch this. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Why? It proves I'm selfless. It proves I'm never living with what's in it for me. That's a strong tower. That's actually powerful. If there's some in it for me, it's weakness. That's a weak link. That's going to be attacked. That's going to be overtaken. He's my rock in defense. I'm going to stand as he is, and you can't touch that, right? So it's God working right before he says to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who worketh in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. Therefore, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Why? So you, you can be seen by the world as innocent, harmless children. If you have a King James, I think the word harmless is blameless. So you can be seen by the world as blameless. Most Christians don't even feel blameless, let alone, or believe blameless, let alone feel blameless. They don't even believe they can be blameless. Like in the sight of God. He's saying you can be that way in the sight of your co-workers. I was two and a half years in a secular job after I got saved. It was one of the funnest things I had done up until then. Can't talk about it. They, they'll, they'll, they'll write so many articles when they, when they hear me say this. If this gets out there, watch this. I'm walking through the hall and they were mocking after two and a half years. And I spun around and I said, isn't that amazing, guys? You're still mocking after two and a half years. You know my life's changed. Every one of your wheels has been. It was the only time I confronted him. It was my last day there. My last day. And I just felt grace to speak up and leave him with a thought. 
And then, and they're all, if you work in a warehouse, they're, they're brutal. They're ruthless, man. There's no mercy in a warehouse. And if it wasn't God, they'd have shouted me down mid-sentence. They just sat there silent. In fact, the hall's a long way out, two sets of double doors, and nobody made a sound the whole way out that hall when I left. And I knew it was the Lord. Well, I knew it was when I spoke it. I said, all your wheels are spinning. You just find strength in numbers. But what does that matter? When you're all alone, you're all thinking because of the life I've lived in the last two and a half years. Because I I looked right at him. It felt so powerful to say this. I said, who of you can point to me and and, and viably or legitimately accuse me of sin? They saw my life was changed. I said, everything about my life has been for the good. There's not one thing negative about it. And then I called him. I said, who can point to me and accuse me of sin in your sight? Why? I did all things without grumbling and complaining so that I was innocent and blameless in their sight. Whom, shining forth as a light, I held forth the word of life. It's Philippians 2. Don't tell me it's not possible. It's in there. No, I experienced it. Because guess what? If I was guilty in their sight, they'd have interrupted me half sentence and shouted out, or they'd have made up three or four things. Nobody said a word. Why? They were convicted to the core because I had lived righteous in their sight and no one could accuse my life. It's so powerful. I got home and you know what the Lord told me? He said, your life lived for the last two and a half years of unstopped ears that were otherwise clogged and couldn't hear. There's men that had shut down because of hypocrisy and things and stuff and people that said they're Christian and lived all this other stuff. He said, your life unstopped their ears and now I have access. (gasps) That's fruit on the tree, baby. Right? Yeah? Because you could just take things personal. Well, that ain't fair. You know what happened? Bosses were asking me to do things because they saw me as a yes man all of a sudden, a pushover, because I wouldn't stand my ground, so they saw it as weakness. My, my co-workers, because it was Teamsters, if you ever worked in a union, it gets ridiculous. All of a sudden, what, what the union was meant to be, it's totally opposite now. Now it's just making employees, that oh, wasn't good. Because now we're teamsters, so now the, my fellow employees are saying, you're making us look bad. You shouldn't be doing that job. You should be bumping that down. Why are you doing that? You don't have to do that. I said, I want to do that. Oh, tell me you want to. I do. I want to do it. Why should I always put it on the low man? Why does the low man get dumped on all the time? I don't mind doing it. I'll do it. I don't have to put it under the low man. It doesn't threaten you at all. Just do your job, man. It's okay. Everything's good. So the bosses were doing this to me, putting me in the middle, but I never felt in the middle because my answers were always sincere. Guess what happened one day? I'm at home on my day off, and, and guess what happened? One of my supervisors called me at my house. Now, this is the stuff you want in your testimonies. Because I'm not evangelizing. I'm not telling him, hey, if you die tonight, no, no, where you're going. I'm just having fun living Jesus. So now my supervisor calls me at home. He's mealy mouth. He's beating around the bush a little, stuttering a lot. And I said, man, get to the point. I don't mind that you called me. You, he said, I'm sorry I called you on your day off. I just, man, I went to... I said, what are you getting at? Just, you have a reason you called me? Just talk to me plain. And I had to give him permission to just get it out. He said, well, I just don't understand how you live the way you do. He said, I know you're going to say it's Jesus, but I don't understand. <laughs> and I said, explain what you're asking. What do you mean, live the way I do? Well, you never change. I see what the bosses are doing. I see how you're taking heat from your coworkers, and you're just always the same, and I can tell it's real, and you're just having the time of your life, and it looks to me like you got a bunch of pressure from all sides, and I'd be losing it by now, and I'd have probably punched somebody. I said, do you have time to come over to my house and sit on my porch and we can talk? He said, I'll be over. It was his day off. He sat on my porch and cried when he understood the gospel and looked in my eyes and saw why I live the way I do and realized he's talking to a man that doesn't just go to church, a man that's surrendered. A man that actually wakes up with a hope in him. That actually is anointed and empowered by the very Spirit of God and the working of grace in hope of the glory of God, the manifestation of the glory of God. That's the manifestation of who he is. The glory of God is God revealed and manifested. And the attribute of God that's seen and known is the glory of God. Yeah? Yeah? I'm not being mean. Don't you? Listen, the scripture says you and I are to always have an answer 
ready when inquired for the hope that we have in us. When people in the public say, why do you live the way you do? Why do you carry so much hope? How many of us have been approached by people, hey man, what's up with you? Why are you living this way? Why are you so excited? Why do you have so much hope? There's something different about you. Like, like I know Christians have been Christians 40, 50 years and nobody even thought of approaching them and asking them to explain the hope in them. Because most of them don't even have the hope in them. They're trying to get through life and wondering what they're doing wrong in prayer. They're reading their fifth faith book. Trying to get breakthrough and answers for their circumstances instead of manifesting Christ every day. Because when you do that, all these other things will be added unto you. You seek first the kingdom of God. And everything you need and everything necessary to walk Him out is going to be there. But that's not mean. I'm not being mean. But the Bible is expecting people to come up to us and say, man, you stand out in the crowd. <laughs> like, why do you have the attitude you have? Why do you hope like you hope? When I look at you, there's, a, there's something about you, man, that I don't know, man. What is going on with you? Like, don't you read the news? Don't you see what's going on? Don't you know what's about to happen here at this job? And you're supposed to be ready to give them a healthy response when they inquire. I know countless people that have never had anybody come up to them and ask why they live the way they live. It's probably supposed to be happening when I read scripture. <laughs> it's, I'm not being mean, it's convicting. If it's good tidings of great joy, the gospel's good tidings of that means the fruit of the good tidings, the result of the good tidings is joy in people. Most people don't carry a noticeable joy. They have seasons of it. They're looking for the anointing of joy or the spirit of joy or joy and hands laid on you. Ha ha ha. But what about just waking up full of joy? Just the average countenance of the average congregation does not exude joy. You guys are different. You really are. It's different from the time I pulled into your driveway, honestly, and laid eyes on your children. No, you have no idea. Very easy to perceive. I thought, what a holy family of God. It just shined through your children. Incredible. Yeah, really did. And I thought, wow. And I got to meet you two and hear your hearts. And I thought, I'm going to meet a whole bunch of people like this. <laughs> Because they're kind of like overseeing this thing. This is going to be cool. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so I just got happy. I thought, this is a cool weekend. Usually, I'm talking to people that don't have a clue. Last week, I was in a, and I talked a little bit like this. And I said, who's uncomfortable right now with what I'm saying? And two-thirds of the people raised their hand. Because they're taught totally against what I'm saying. That's not an accident. That's designed by the enemy hoping that you continue to go to church and just never be her. And then going takes the place of being her. And now you got 50 years of church attendance, but you get thrown into a crisis and respond like the man that doesn't even believe in God. That's a bummer. Ain't nobody going to ask you to inquire about that hope. <laughs> Did I turn you to 1 John 4? I'm sorry, I'm having fun. Do you know, I've been saved 29 years in June. I'm as passionate as I can ever remember being when I shared these truths. 29 years later. But I got 29 years of living what I'm telling you. Experiential, there's nothing you could do. You couldn't write an article nasty enough to even close to affect me. Like there's people that don't agree with me that I don't read any of that stuff. Some of my friends, I have to tell them to stop reading that stuff. And they, they hurt for me or they get mad for me. I'm like, stop, I'm not mad. <laughs> or uh, one of my friends started to chat back with one of these folks and, I, and then they're just chatting and I'm like, that's, stop, that's never ending, stop, just stop. Go out and love somebody. Go pray for somebody. Get off of there. Like, See, they're writing all this stuff, but I'm living the way I'm living. And just because they don't theologically agree, but you can't stop me and keep me now from hearing his voice, walking in love. You, can, you can't stop me. You can't stop me from praying for the sick. You can't stop me from manifesting Christ. Way too late. 
But you can say anything you want. I know who I am now, and I didn't wake up for you to say nice things. I woke up to be like him. And it's a little scary that that many people can't recognize him just because they don't theologically agree. Sounds familiar like that's what Jesus went through. You know, we got circles in the body of Christ. We got like, well, which stream are you in? I got asked that so many times. I, to, I am not in a stream. I'm, I'm in the Lord. Like, I'm not in a stream. If all these streams come together, you'd have a river. That sounds better. So why don't we just get all the streams together and got one big happy flowing river? You take a couple steps and you're up over your head. Yeah? What stream are you in? I have never hung around in a stream. <laughs> There's a river in me coming out of my belly. But then that's blasphemy because, you know. It's... Well, this he spoke of the Spirit who had not yet been given because he had not been yet glorified. But then you got all the camps out there. Well, you don't even have the person of the Holy Spirit. That all passed away. Everything died when the apostles died. Well, there's not a separate baptism. You get as much of the Spirit of God when you get born again as you're ever going to have. All that's out there. And what they do is, if you don't agree with them, you're a heretic. But the last I saw, I'm righteous in His sight, holy, blameless, and above reproach. My conscience is clear. My face is unveiled. When I sit on an airplane, I sure get insight with the person sitting beside me, and they end up crying, and I have a good time in my life. <laughs> so I'm just going to stick with what I'm experiencing. And you can call me anything you want, but that person that just cried on the plane, they love me, they'll hug me, and they blame it all on Jesus. They don't even make it about me, because I make sure they know who it is in me. So it sounds like I'm just doing what I'm called to do. So just because you don't agree with me? Come on, you can't slow this down. This train's rolling. You either jump on the train or get off the tracks because it'll run you over. Because you can't make God stop loving. You can't write enough bad articles about God to change who He is. You know people have lied on God big time. They've blamed Him for a lot of stuff. There's a lot of twisted theologies out there. But God is who He is. And one day we're going to see Him as He is. That's right. So you might as well see Him through His Son because that's the best look you've ever had. Because when you see Jesus, you've seen your Father. And Jesus is very attractive to me. And if that's my Father manifesting through Jesus and then Jesus told me to follow Him, so who am I manifesting? The Father. So Jesus brought me back to the image. You get it? So when I'm following Jesus, who am I following? And I'm the manifestation of the Father. Ain't that something? Growing up, I was told, well, I wasn't even told this. There was nobody even close to preaching this. This would have been the devil in the flesh talking like this. But when I open my Bible, it's all through Scripture. Watch this. Watch this. 1 John 4. He who doesn't love, verse 8. Does not know God, for God is love. Isn't that a powerful, convicting phrase? So, like, if you're, not, if you're struggling with walking in love, like, don't say, you know, there's a joke in the church. Don't pray for patience. God will give it to you. Well, patience is a lack of love. Like, if you, if you don't have patience, it means you don't have love. Love is patience. So don't go for the attributes. Just go for the love. In other words, God, I want to become love. You kneel when nobody's looking. You get alone in your bedroom. Close the door. Be undistracted. Shut everything down, man. And make first things first. God, you loved me when my life was unlovable. I was riddled with sin and I had desires of sin and I had twisted in my mind and my motives and you never lost sight. You never changed your mind. I, I didn't even have the ability to affect you. The worse I was, the more you came when I read scripture and you washed me clean. You caused me to stand before you as if I've never sinned. You see me as if I've always been a son and never made a wrong turn. You get alone, you establish that, and you put that on. And when you put that on, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, the reason He loved me this way is because He's love, and this is who He is, but this is who He created me to be for His image, so this is what He wants to empower me to be. So it ain't enough to be loved by God, it's enough to become the love of God. So all of a sudden now I realize the whole goal is becoming the love of God. Not being loved by God, not, hey, did you pray the prayer here? Are you saved? Are you saved here? Are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. No, do you love like He loved you? 
Is it enough to receive mercy or is it enough to become merciful? Is it enough to be forgiven or is it enough to become forgiveness? Come on, who are we? The body of? You look it up, the embodiment of Him. We embody Him. So don't sell cheap and don't say, yeah, but, you know, I mean, it can't really mean that because everybody. No, we're not following everybody. We're following him. Yeah, but brother, we all stop. I'm done. I'm not buying into that. What do you mean we all? Try to run that by Jesus. See, we're following him, not we all. And if you'll draw a line and you'll, you'll activate faith, you'll come out of the world. You'll be in it, but not of it. And some preachers will preach that it's still in me. You who love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in Him. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It's all self-centered stuff. The Bible talks about selfishness strongly. It says if you have self-centeredness in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom did not come from above. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. And where self-centeredness exists, there's confusion and every evil work is present. That sounds perverted. Self-centeredness. I mean, I'm just telling you people, we've been lulled to sleep. If we're not careful, we'll function in self-centeredness and actually uphold our right for feeling that way. Our right for reacting that way. So how do you deny yourself and have so many rights? Self-centeredness is a wretch, man. I'm telling you, it's a prison. And a lot of people were so inoculated by just living that way all our life that we don't even call it what it is. The reason you're hurt, offended, angry, in unforgiveness, discouraged is all because of self-centeredness. If you take self-centeredness away, none of those things have the power to exist. They have nowhere to rest. Are you with me? I'm not being mean. I'm not saying certain pastors, like specifically. But if a pastor's not living the way I'm preaching, he'll never preach it. He'll preach his own reality. Because it's his highest revelation. His own experience becomes truth. Are you with me? And then somebody that's talking like me becomes high-minded. Not keeping it real. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. And all I'm doing is following him. And believe in scripture. So when my wife's struggling for eight years, I don't know how to be offended. I don't know how to be hurt, and I sure don't know how to give up. Oh, that's a good one. I don't know how to become a statistic. I don't know how to come up with a story good enough to justify my feelings and my actions. I just know how to lay down my life and stand my ground because she's in trouble and I ain't got a problem. I got the kingdom of God on the inside of me. Yeah? Yeah, but didn't you get lonely? How can I be lonely when I'm filled with Him? I am never alone. Loneliness is an impossibility in the relationship I have with God. Are you hearing me? But I'm just alone. A lot of people tell me they're alone. I'm saying that's a warning sign that you don't have communion with Him like you could. Because Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2, and you are complete in Him. Yeah? Yeah? Complete doesn't sound like lonely. <laughs> Yay. All these answers are in the Word. Amen? Let me, let me do this. I'm sorry. Where, what time is it? You know, it's late, isn't it? It's really late. You got all these children? Oh, my goodness. No, you got tons of children. Oh, my goodness. What? I got to wrap this up. In this, the love of God was made known towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world. Uh Uh-oh, that we might live for Him? Does it say for Him? Uh Uh-oh. That's way different than for Him, isn't it? Do you catch that stuff in your Bibles? You pull this out, right? You preach this stuff to them, don't you? Yeah. That we might live what? For Him. Let me 
Christ is one. So everything I see him to be, I can manifest and live when I see my life one with him. So I'm not living for him. He didn't call us servants. He calls us sons. Why? Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. That means his son knows exactly what he's up to. And I'm going to live through him. So the measuring stick of God loving me is Christ crucified, never my circumstances. Did you ever hear somebody that's sincere, that loves God? They go to church, they, they're gathering these fellowships like this, and they're sincere. But yet they get overwhelmed by life and say, I don't know where God's love is. I thought God loved me. And the first thing that gets challenged is God's love for them through crisis and trials. When we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in love, Right? Because love will never fail because the measuring stick of God's love is Christ crucified, not how things are going. So if you question God's love in the middle of how things are going, you won't be rooted and grounded in it. And if faith works through love, you'll never move by faith. You'll move by need all the time. And the harder it becomes, the more your need, and now you question God even more, and then you break down and wonder where He was, and you even think He might have failed you. And when they sing God is good, all that comes to your mind is that season. See what happens to people? To trap. We pray for the sick. When we pray for the sick, I think tomorrow night, he's going to have this place probably going to be full tomorrow, isn't it? There's a way I like to pray for the sick. We could do it tonight, but it's, it's way too late now with all these children. <laughs> it just is. And they're so peaceful. This is just a grace on you guys. But, but we're going to pray for all the sick. I, I, we'll just get the whole room together and we'll do it because it's going to take a long time if I do it tonight and tomorrow. I was thinking earlier I'll do it tonight and tomorrow, but here we are. But... But what I tell before we pray for him, you know what I say? I say, I want you to do one thing and one thing only. Father, you have to love me. Because sometimes when you're going through an ongoing thing, and you've been prayed for five times and by three people that you swear are anointed, and you don't have any change, you know what people do? You start questioning, and what's going on? What am I doing wrong? Is God trying to teach me something? What am I missing? Something's blocking my healing. I would call all those questions identity crisis. They're all rationale. They all pull you out of a solid foundation of He loves you, period. His blood's speaking better things. He's redemptive and He's doing a work of me and seeing yourself in Christ in the middle of your biggest challenges. Where you're just unmoved and unchanged. Where you never turn faith into a point in time or a hit, miss, win, or lose. But faith is what you believe. Are you with me? So what I have everybody do that's going through any kind of sicknesses, believe this one thing and only this one thing for the rest of your lives. Father, you have to love me or you'd have never sent your son. Period. And then you live there for the rest of your life. And then you wake up that way and you go to bed that way and you thank him for the work and the grace and the things he's doing in your body. That's how our bodies are going to change. We're not trying to go for a healing. We're living in him. We're living through him. Does this make sense? So I, I'm sorry it's getting so late here. I'm going to try to hurry here. So, so, so in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son. So He nails that down in two verses in a row. He just nails that down to be a perpetuation for our sins. That's the mercy seat, right? Mm-hmm. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is amazing. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. So the evidence of everything that God intended through His love is when we begin to love one another. Now we're not just talking about strong emotion and affection for one another. We're talking about agape love here. He's talking about love that never fails. Love that doesn't seek its own. Love that takes no account of a suffered wrong. A love that protects and binds together this community and fellowship. A love that doesn't get inwardly offended and then backbite and bicker and and then the cancer of things spread and now you got four more people hurt through your story and stuff happens all the time when God's rolling in people. That kind of stuff. You can live sanctified from all that. The more your identity is secure, the more your motive is on track and on point, and the more your why in your life is settled, the better you'll respond in the midst of all that stuff. And if somebody stops, you know what I used to do when I pastor full time? People would come and say, you know, and they talk about somebody in the congregation to me. 
And I'd say, well, I don't know that to be true at all. Do you know that to be true? Well, I said, no. Do you know their number? Call them right now. Let's, let's find out what's going on. Well, I don't, well. <laughs> no, 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 wait a minute. You're going to come behind the scenes, talk to me, and tell me information. Put that seed in my soul so that when I look at their face, I have to consider that or deal with that. And then you don't want to talk to them personally? You should have talked to them before you ever came to me. This is a nasty seed here. So that's either find out what's going on or hey, get this thing ripped out and thrown into the trash. Call them. And that's how I would pastor. Word got around real quick. People didn't come to me with stuff. <laughs> Which not isn't always the highest answer. The point I'm trying to get across is what I want them to learn. That if I don't even know this to be true about him, why would I ever say something to Ben? And then I haven't even gone to him. So I always would say, well, did you even talk to them? Did you go to them? Well, how do you even know it to be true? Oh, it's true. Believe me, it's true. Well, how do you know it's true? And if you're sure it's true, doesn't that hurt you for so-and-so? Why don't you sit them down like a brother in private and try to just talk to them and deal with that? And because now you're passing that on to me and you're already affected by the information and I can see it's pulled you out of a righteous place. You already see them for less than who Christ sees them for. And that's pastoring. And you're trying to do that all the time to keep people to get them into that single eye that Jesus lives with. You see what I'm saying? You can't tell me it's impossible to live this way. Jesus calls us to live this way. So, so we're going to love one another. No one's seen God. Okay, his love's perfected in us. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. That's pretty intimate. He's given us his spirit. Woo-hoo. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son as Savior of the world. And whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And we have known, this is important, this is intimate, we have known and believed the love God has for us. God is love, and He who abides in love abides in God and God in Him. How intimate is that? Look what he's saying. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. Do you know how many people struggle with the love God has for us? Do you know how many people feel unworthy, unworthy, feel like they aren't totally forgiven and still identify themselves by themselves or through themselves even though they say they've been forgiven? You have to see yourself the way God sees you continually. Because if you see yourself the way God sees you, you'll have the healthy ability to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't see yourself clear, how are you going to love your neighbor clear? Your neighbor doesn't want you to love them as you love yourself if you don't love yourself clear. <laughs> no, there's a principle there. That I'm going to see you the way I see me. And the clearer view I have of me, the best view I've ever had of you. So we got to put this thing on. Yeah? Come on. So look, this is what I want to close with. So love has, oh my, perfected. Who likes that word perfected? It just means made complete. Love has been perfected among us in this. So in this one truth. And then there's a colon there. Oh my goodness. So love has been perfected among us in this. Here's the answer. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The day of judgment is not described in your Bible as a day of boldness. Day of darkness, dread, fear, gloom, despair. There's a lot of adjectives in there, not boldness. You all understand? Watch. Love has been perfected in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? How is that possible? Because as He is... What's the whole chapter almost redundantly say he is? Love. His love. His, as he is, so are we. Meaning right now, right here in this world where we live. And when he comes, he sees who he is in us. And it makes us one and we have boldness. Why? Because as he, not because we serve in a ministry. Not because we sing with all our heart. Not because we pray daily. All those things are pieces of the Christian life. Watch. 
Because as He, so are. Do you hear any limitation there? Or do you hear oneness? Is there any limitation? Any man that says he believes in me ought to walk even, or believes in him ought to walk even as he walk. We walk in the light as he's in the light. Purify himself even as he is pure. As he is, so are we in this world. That's all in 1 John. Back in Ephesians. Walk in love just as he loved. Jesus said, if you believe in me, the things I do, you'll do. And even greater things. Do you hear any limitation in all those scriptures? Romans 8 says we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. A lot of theologians will say that's the day that's coming. None of those scriptures I just quoted to you tonight have anything to do with the day that's coming. It's the day that now is. And if you receive the abundance of grace, that means it's more than enough working power on your behalf if you're willing. And the free gift of righteousness, that means what Jesus paid for to make you right in the sight of God. If you receive His power on your behalf, And the gift of righteousness that Jesus paid for to make you right in the sight of God, you will reign in this life as a king. Does that make sense? So listen, I'm just closing with this. The whole goal and the whole... And this isn't anything you guys haven't been taught and don't know. It's just good to establish it. Peter said, I write these things to you even though you know them and are established in them. But I think it's safe to stir you by reminding and as long as I'm here, I'm going to make sure of it. And even after my departure, I'm going to make sure you have these things in front of you as a reminder. Peter wrote that in 2 Peter 1. Yeah, at the end of the chapter. And I'm like, wow. Hebrews 2, take earnest heed to the things you heard, at least they slip away. Philippians, Paul said, it's not tedious to write the same thing over and over to you. For you, it's a safeguard. I don't think I preached anything tonight you haven't heard, but it's what we become. And the whole reason for the cross isn't just so you get your sins forgiven so you can go to heaven. The whole reason for the cross is so that the nature of God comes back into men and men can walk in love again and live by His Spirit again. If we miss love, this is the bold statement I make all the time everywhere I go. If we miss becoming love, I am convinced, personally convinced through Scripture, that we'll miss walking in the very reason that He came. If we miss becoming love, we miss the whole point of the cross. The cross isn't so I get loved by Him. It's so that I'm empowered to become what He is. I am, you are. The body of Christ. Ain't that something? So Father, I just thank you for this grace. I pray for these families to stay encouraged and strong and one. I pray that this revelation would just burn in us. That that we would have such a desire to walk in everything that you paid for, God. But no one would get striving. No one would get tricked into works. No one would live in a secret condemnation. I pray, Lord God, that you lead us all into communion and fellowship so that we're all saved by grace through faith. That as we're willing and desire, your grace makes everything we desire our reality. And I pray that this house knows true communion, fellowship and relationship with you in a special, intimate, face-to-face way. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Father, for your hand on every family, on all these children. Just the thing I perceived walking through here tonight, God, I thank you for it. Just that solid, just that healthy thing that that I was very aware of, that I perceived in my spirit, God, I pray that you continue to increase it more and more and let more see and understand that these children are even growing up in this truth and being touched and marked by it in ways probably that we don't even realize. God, thank you for the honor of living what you intended. And we just pray that you continue to grant us wisdom, grant these leaders wisdom, and give us always eyes to see and hearts to understand. I ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This one thing came on my heart. I'm just going to address it quickly. If you have a hard time sleeping because of some reason, especially physical discomfort, pain, sleeping is a challenge or just just because you can't sleep. Is there someone here that has a hard time sleeping, especially because of pain and discomfort? Is there is that is that 
Is this yours just, is it more emotional? Is it just it's like a sleep disorder, like insomnia? Yeah. Okay. And you had, okay, both. And you, what was yours back there? Both. Okay, could you stand to your feet? We're going to believe for you. I'll stand to your feet if that's you. I usually, I usually ask the people to go home and just pray, but I, I felt like there's, it's, the, the both thing is, is, I still want you to pray. When you go, when you go back to your, to your home tonight and it's time to go to bed, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Even though you've had this experience, listen, don't dread the night. Thank Him that He loves you. Thank Him that you're His. Be absolutely intimate with Him and talk to Him. Like, don't go try to sleep. You know what I'm saying? Just go home and just be like, you know what? This is no time to dread. This is a time to just be loved and be His. But I felt like I was actually supposed to pray for you guys tonight, which is very rare. I usually don't pray for this. I actually send people home to talk to Him. And if you're on sleep pills or stuff, I just say, man, just push them aside because I've looked into that. You can't hurt yourself by not taking them other than you just wouldn't sleep under normal conditions. But because I don't tell people to stop their meds and cold turkey their meds. But in sleep disorder, I do because I've looked into it and it doesn't harm anything. But if you do take something that aids you in sleep and that's not sin and it's not wrong. But tonight, if you would sit, sit that aside and say, you know, I've been taking this and it's actually been helping. But tonight I see you're all that I need and your love for me is enough. Yeah. I mean, be, be that real with him and your love for me is enough. And tonight I'm going to sleep because you love me that much. Thank you for it, Father. And just go ahead and crawl in bed, okay? So, Father, I was in a church in Texas. The lady didn't sleep for 20 years. She slept two hours was the max she's ever slept at one time in all those years. Two hours. She was on all kinds of stuff. She was getting psychological treatment stuff. She was doing, and it was just became a trauma to her. And, and it just gripped her identity because it was such a big deal, right? And when we did this thing, she's back there crying and crying because it was making her more and more disbelieving. Like, this man's acting so simple, he's like doesn't understand how intense this is. And I was drawn to her crying from the Lord. And I just said, honey, and I will start walking back and I'm talking to her and everybody's standing. It was a big church. It was a lot of people. And she said, you don't understand. And she told me her whole story. And I said, honey, tonight, I, I get it, and I'm sorry. I, I'm not making light of it. I am sorry. I wish that wasn't your story, but it is. Tonight, you talk to him in your bed. Face to face, talk to him as if he's right there. And believe he is, whether you feel nothing, whether it seems like he's a million miles away, talk to him like he's right there. And just talk to him and tell him that you believe he loves you, and you're going to sleep tonight because he loves you, etc. And she's just bawling. I said, you're going to? She said, I will. I said, had a girl. And I said, and you are going to sleep tonight. So I'm turning to go to the front, and the whole room felt a little pulled by her. It was heavy. It just felt pulled because it was a rough story. And I was being lighthearted. I was just being lighthearted. But sometimes Jesus is like, you know what? I spun around. I said, in fact, you know what, girl? You're going to sleep so long, so solid, so sound. Jesus himself probably going to have to come and just wake you up. And everybody <laughs> chuckled and the room felt good again. Like we could go on to wherever we were at preaching. Well, this lady goes home and gets in bed. She's never slept more than two hours is the max she's ever slept at one time. She crawls in bed and she's crying a little. She gets in bed. She says, you know what, Lord? That guy was serious. He was sincere. You know, I'm just believing you love me or you wouldn't have sent Jesus. It makes sense, but I've been through this and this, but tonight, I'm believing. And she just kind of shared the next day what she said. She, she was laying sideways, clock's right there on her little thing, and she just closes her eyes. So she's laying there sleeping, and somebody takes her shoulder. Now, she's all alone in the bedroom. She don't have a husband. Sandy, Sandy. And she goes, who's in my room? And there's nobody. She looks. It was 12 o'clock when she laid on her pillow. It was 8 in the morning. (laughs) Jesus, when I said that, he said, you know what, Dan? I didn't tell you to say that, but that was cool. (laughs) I'm going to, I'll go wake her up in the morning. And he actually did it. He he shook her shoulder because when I came in in the morning, they said, that lady, Sandy, that was about to sleep in the 20th century, She's in the foyer. She can't even speak. She's crying so hard. There's a, there's a whole group around her praying for her, but she can't even communicate. And I went, oh, no. You know, it, it felt bad. Like, oh, no. She went home and had the worst night ever or what? Like, what? And I run over there and I got in the circle and I was just going to hold her and pray. And honey, 
She told us that story, and now we're all crying. Jesus comes in, pushes her shoulder, Sandy, Sandy. And then she's like, who's in my room? Who's touching my... And she's like, there's nobody in my room. And then it's like, what? And then she looks at the clock. <laughs> 20 years of torment at night. And one little bit of communication, and she slept all night. So, Father, I thank you for these Amen. folks. I thank you tonight will be amazing. They're going to sleep tonight. There'll be no physical pain, no physical distraction, no solical duress or distraction. I just thank you there'll be grace and peace on everyone that stood up. Lord God, I thank you there'll be healing right now in their bodies. And Lord, as they talk to you tonight, go on to bed. I just thank you your grace, reality, and your love just envelops them. And it'll be an amazing night. From now on. Every night in your presence. I bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.